So assuming there's not some sort of crazy variance with injuries or one score games, Notre Dame's going to be there in that final 12. Hello and welcome in. It's always college football. Today is Thursday, August 15th. I know we're getting to you a little late. We apologize. It's a little later than we usually release our show here on Thursdays, but I promise it's worth waiting for. Today is a gambling preview. If you want to have a little action, if you want to tail some experts, today is your day. We are very lucky at ESPN to have a ton of great, great hosts and analysts in this space, and we're lucky to be joined by two of those today, two of my good buddies. I join them all the time on ESPN Bet, formerly to join them on Daily Wager, but now they are doing a terrific job ushering in this new college football world and how we should look at it a little differently if you're looking to make a couple plays here in the preseason. Tyler Fulgham will join us, as will Joe Fortenbaugh. So it'll be a lot of fun, kind of kick a few things around, see what they might like from a season win total perspective. See how they feel about maybe some conference championship plays. Do they or do they not play the Heisman Trophy? Should they play the Heisman Trophy? And I know Joe is very hot on some yes or no playoff or no playoff bets on a few of these teams. Let's not waste any time. It's Tyler and Joe joining us here from ESPN Bet. All right, so I've joined these guys a million times. It's time that they join me. Tyler Fulgham and Joe Fortenbaugh from ESPN Bet Fame. We've done picks all throughout the college football season the last couple of years. Check them out. They're super fun. These guys are super buttoned up on college football, and they're pretty dialed in. I mean, last couple of years when we've done the trivia or the pick three or whatever, it's been really tough to get inside you guys and i live the sport y'all are picking college football on like 17 other picks so what's the word fellas how we look at first off don't play coy you won the contest two years ago so this is a whole like shell game you're yeah. playing here with the you know it's been a lot of fun coming on with you guys you're just baiting us to hype you up which job no. well done you got us there if yeah, you guys you guys spend about like 30 minutes on college football a week I spend 30 hours on college football a week in addition to like, so I would hope I'd win. And the fact that it comes down to the end, the way it does just goes to show you how wired you guys are on all sports, not just college football. But Tyler, I get the sense this year that you're already seeing it kind of the same way I'm seeing it. I'm concerned about that because when we're on the same page, that means Vegas probably has us, don't yeah. you think? Uh, yeah, now usually Joe may not be man enough to admit it. I am. My college football picks generally happen later in the week. After you've been on ESPN Bet Live, I <laughs> listen to what McElroy's tail in there. Then I kind of, you know, slide in and tail most of those. But there are a couple, a few, more than a few, I guess, public teams, public universities that I have a strong conviction about. And it seems the public also shares that conviction. And we know in this particular uh, industry, in this game. That's not always a good thing. Well, all right, so let's start with you, Joe. Are there any teams, when you look at their season win total over under, I, I understand it's dependent on the number, all right? If you throw a Michigan, you know, seven and a half out there, like, I'm freaking out because I'm like, <laughs> you know, I know the public wants to bet the over on Michigan, but now it's a seven and a half, I'm panicked. So, are there any teams that you just flat out avoid on an annual basis based on public sentiment? No, there's always a team that ends up being that team that whether I bet on them or against them over or under throughout the course of the season, I just see it wrong. And I just, I will hate that team. And then I'll have to get that out of my mind at the end of the year. I think, however, we're presented with one of the best opportunities we've been presented in for a long time in this sport or gambling yeah. in general. Because when you expand to a 12-team playoff and you alter the manner in which everyone goes about their business, inside that chaos, there's opportunity, right? Like bookmakers are scrambling too, because I know Feinbaum was talking about this topic and some people found it ridiculous, but just as a hypothetical, as a thought experiment, look at the Iron Bowl. Such an important game for those two teams every single year. But if you happen to be Alabama and you're undefeated going into that game, and you know your spot in the SEC championship game is secure. Are you thinking maybe about resting some starters there to roll into the SEC championship game, knowing that that matters more, winning that conference, 
securing a top four seed, getting a bye. We've never dealt with that before, right? There are spots this year where teams midway through the year might have to go to a Boston college. Do you send your B squad up there and rest the stars? Because you don't need to go undefeated. So I think with so much up in the air, there's a lot of opportunity. And I say that, and I come back to old reliable. Utah, you know that's where I go. If we're going to start with a pick right out of the top, that's a team that transferring conferences, I think a lot of people look at schools from the Pac-12 going to the Big Ten, and they think this is going to be a problem. Texas and Oklahoma going to the SEC, this is going to be a problem. I see opportunity for Utah. They build in the trenches. That's going to transfer conferences no matter where you're going from. If you're stout up front, you're going to be able to travel and play on the road. And on top of that, if you've got veteran quarterback play, you're going to be in a good situation regardless. So I look at their schedule. I see them in one dog spot. It's at Stillwater against Oklahoma State late September. It's a winnable game. Win total is nine and a half, which means I can give up three losses to the point where I lose. So two are freebies. You get past Oklahoma State, I think we're in good shape. So that's the first team that comes to mind. I love that. Trap, I know a couple teams are already jumping out to you. Uh, but before you give me a pick or two on some win totals that you've been eyeing, are there any stay away? Like, I'm not touching it under any circumstance this part of the season. Like, is there a bet that you just avoid like the plague, a la Georgia win total over? Because everyone seems to think they're going to win all their games. They're favored in every game. How could they possibly lose? Is there anything? Just no doubt about it. No questions asked. I'm staying away. Yeah, it's uh, Joe's favorite program, the Colorado Buffaloes. We know that they are one of the most popular. They barely made it over their win total last year, even though they stumbled down the stretch. All eyes are on Coach Prime in that program. Now that win total is up at five and a half. I think a lot of people are going to say, what, they won four games last year. Now they have to increase on that by two. The over five and a half is something I think a lot of people may look at and say, nah, they can't do that. But I think Coach Prime is a good coach and I think a year of that program the transfers we out the the uh former Buffaloes that he didn't think fit in his program a year of development for his son Shador Sanders and Travis Hunter who might be the best overall college football player in the country when you have two talents like that man I think you can go almost anywhere on any given Saturday and win now of course defense and offensive line play were a problem so I'll have to wait until I see them on the field before I get a firmer grip on how good this team actually is but The Buffaloes are clearly a team that everyone has their eye on. And when everyone has their eye on a program, that's usually where the bookmakers are sharpest. You know what I'm saying? So I'm staying away from Colorado. Wouldn't be surprised if they're a five-win team, a six-win team, a four-win team, or an eight-win team this year. As unpopular as it is, I think one of the best markets to avoid is the Heisman market. Everyone wants to talk about it. Like, we're going to talk about it, but the reality is the favorite hasn't hit since Mariota in 2014. And you've had, I believe, six of the last 15 have started the season either at 100 to 1 or greater, or they haven't even been posted. Like, that's a market that you can find great spots throughout the course of the year. And I think playing it early in the year, I don't think it's a smart move. I think you can find a lot better ways to attack the Heisman market once we get in season and you pay attention to the upcoming spots on the schedule. It's hard to argue with that at all. I, I don't know how anyone can get on board with a Heisman bet because one, the odds aren't that great. I mean, in some cases, you're getting 10, 12, 15 to one in some spots. Like I, I mean, I, I'd rather I'd rather make a play on a on an Oklahoma State to win the Big Twelve. At least there's a little more predictability. I kind of know what's coming. The Heisman's a popularity contest, and it's really going to come down to the best quarterback arguably on one of the best teams. So you take the playoff contenders, you shrink the field, and then it becomes a quarterback award. And more often than not, you can probably figure out who the guys are going to be. And at that point, when there's really only seven or eight candidates, is there good value at 10 to 12 to one? I, I'd rather place it elsewhere. If I only had so many bullets, I'm only going to spend them on things that oh. I feel are a little more predictable. When you look, Tyler, how would you assess the – the new additions, we already kind of mm-hmm. hit Texas and Oklahoma mm-hmm. already. And I know you're already there. Um, I know where Joe is on Utah. Like, goodness gracious, alive, move to Salt Lake. But <laughs> how would you assess Texas, for example, moving yep. into the SEC as it, as it pertains to their win total of 10 and a half? Yeah, I'm under 10 and a half with Texas. Oregon's another team that's at 10 and a half. Uh, just stretching out kind of big picture, 
embracing the chaos and that thought exercise that Joe talked about, will we see coaches motivated for all 12 games on the schedule like before? All those teams up at 10 and a half, I'm very interested in the under. With conference schedules becoming deeper and more difficult, and with NIL and transfer reshaping rosters so quickly from fall to fall, that uncertainty. Like, we know Dylan Gabriel's a good quarterback, but what's he going to look like at Oregon? Like, we know Will Howard had some success at K-State. What's he going to look like in Ryan Day's offense at Ohio State? So I'm generally defaulting to unders with the highest win totals in college football. That's probably not breaking news for your smartest betters out there. But as it pertains to Texas, I look at what they lost as far as talent. And it reminds me of – a couple of years ago when Mac Brown's UNC team was coming off a really good year, their win total was posted at 10 and a half in the ACC. And I said, no way. Hammer the under there. They lost Javante Williams. They lost their second string running back. They lost wide receivers. They lost a quarterback. They lost defensive players as well. When you look at what Steve Sarkeesian lost down there in Austin, it's wide receiver one. It's wide receiver two. It's tight end one. It's RB one. It's RB two. It's uh, your green dot middle linebacker, cornerbacks as well. I know Quinn Ewers is still there, and that quarterback room is nice, but there's going to be so much turnover from premium roster talent on his team that now he's got to travel to the SEC and take on those schedules where in November you're playing at Florida or you know at Starkville or at Columbia. I don't have their schedule memorized uh, quite yet, but you're going to be playing more difficult programs, more difficult venues in November than going to Texas Tech Lubbock going to K-State Manhattan. So I'm definitely on the under with Texas. They only have, you know, room for one loss. If you're going to go over 10 and a half, I'm less skeptical about Oregon just because the price on the over is even money. The most difficult game on their schedule is Ohio State at Autzen Stadium, one of the best home field environments in the country. The only other real difficult game they have is going to Michigan. And how good is Michigan going to be without J.J. McCarthy and Jim Harbaugh? Um, and Dylan Gabriel is the Heisman favorite. I don't know if I'm bet that, but he's obviously a really good college football player. So, I mean, ha- Texas under is one of my favorite. We'll see about Oregon. Uh, that may be one where it's over or pass for me. Uh, don't know what I want to do with them yet, but uh, if any team is to go over 10 and a half, that's moving conferences. I think Oregon would be the one I'd look at first. With Texas, one of the things you want to ask yourself is how much – How much better were they than they looked last year? How much worse were they than they looked last year? Like, what's the view of last year? And then how much different could it have been if a couple things flipped? Sometimes a team just rolls through a schedule. They are who they say they are. Point differential, right? Like, this is where the advanced analytics comes into play when people talk about one-score games. Last year, there was opportunity. They were nine and a half. They could lose two games. And when they beat Bama early in the season, they really set themselves up nicely. Tyler mentions how you can only lose one game this year. You got the Oklahoma-Georgia back-to-back. But the thing you want to look at with Texas is people remember 11-1 and playoff team, they're back. What they don't remember Ooh. is the overtime game against Kansas State. They don't remember how they almost blew it against Houston. They don't remember how they almost blew it against TCU, right? If you bet them last year over like I did, I was sweating all of those games, every single one of them. And you realize Sarkeesian, for as good a coach he is, He can be sloppy late in games. That team can get away from them and games can get away from them. You don't have that margin for error when your win total is 10 and a half. So I'd be real careful with them because if they had lost one of those games last year, the Kansas State, the Houston, or the TCU games, they go 10 and two, they're not in the playoff, and their win total this year is not 10 and a half. How do you guys assess new first-year coaches? I mean, I know there's uh, a program stability metric that gamblers use when looking at and trying to gain an edge. And, and maybe, for example, Dion last year, there was a the kind of a cloak of secrecy about what they might look like offensively. So in a week one game against TCU, catching three touchdowns, like perfect. TCU has no idea what I'm going to do offensively. They're going to be chasing ghosts. We're going to have the element of surprise kind of up our sleeve. So do you give the benefit of the doubt to first year head coaches in week one settings? What is the public perception of the hire and what's the reality of the hire? I think Texas A&M with Mike Elko is a perfect example, right? Like when they hired Elko, the masses who don't really pay attention sat there and thought that was very uninspiring, right? They wanted a big name, a huge name. They're used to Jimbo. They see all the big names that are hired in the SEC. So you hear Mike Elko from Duke and the thought process is, all right, you know, who knows what this guy can do? Mike Elko is a damn good coach. 
Anyone who's paying attention knows Mike Elko is a good coach. So the public perception can drive that price down a little bit on AM. People aren't very excited about him. Anyone you talk to in Vegas who does this for a living and puts their power rankings together, they have him rated higher than Texas AM uh, is would be in the AP pool or the coaches pool. Like they're getting a lot more respect in Vegas. That discrepancy is where you find the opportunity, where the sharp guys are buying, but everybody else is selling. So again, to Tyler's point, it's a coach by coach basis, but there are a lot of those spots out there. It's amazing. I'm looking at the A and M kind of rating, and A and M, according to Vegas right now, about 15th in, yeah. in the ratings right now as far as what they have, and I think that's probably about right with the upside that they have and the opportunity they have, frankly, in like a week one game against Notre yeah. Dame, where they are a slight favorite at home when factoring in the home field. Uh, Notre Dame's quite a bit ahead of them, but the home field, man, for AM, week one, first new year head coach, I kind of like to play. Uh, all right, moving into some win totals. We already know that, that Joe, you're all over Utah. Tyler, I know you're all over Texas. Are there mm-hmm. any others? We'll start with you, Joe, that have kind of jumped off the page to you so far. Under on Houston, that's one that you're not going to hear on any network anywhere because it's not popular enough. But if you talk to anybody in Las Vegas, like everyone's lining up to play the under on Houston, the schedule is just a brutal setup for them this year. It's absolutely brutal. They're a team that they made a good coaching hire, and in the next two to three years, they're going to be in buy spots because they're going to come off a terrible year this year, and then next year people will be down on them. But that's a team right now that I would look at to go under just because the schedule sets up so brutal for them. Um, Miami's a team I'm high on, plus 210 for the playoffs. One game in a dog roll, which is going to be at home against Florida State, and I think Florida State is down this season. So there's going to be an opportunity. You got to survive the swamp in week one, which is going to be a tough game. And if you've been watching that line, anytime it touches Miami minus three on the road, immediately there's buyback off that key number with everyone grabbing Florida. So the pros are going to be on Florida plus the three. Inside of that, it might be people lining up on Miami at less than a field goal. I think they can navigate the season, but you got to trust Cristobal there. You got to trust the late game scenarios for Mario Cristobal. And that's where he came up short last season. So something to keep in mind. Michigan under nine and a half was a play. That's gone now, so I'm probably avoiding that. USC under seven and a half was something I was looking at. Small play, not big on that one. I found myself locking in only a handful of season win totals, maybe eight to ten. I've been doing a lot more with yes-no playoffs because I think expanding the 12, it's putting you in a situation where we can hedge off late in the year if certain scenarios line up poorly. You have so many marquee games late that if you get yourself right on the fringe and you're looking good, but maybe you're rolling into a tough matchup, there's going to be a lot of hedge spots. Always keep that in mind with season win total bets and everything that goes the distance. Can you hedge out late and lock in a profit or get out of a bad position late with a good opportunity? You have to keep that stuff in mind to avoid big, big potential losses or at least to lock in profits. Yeah, I, I was going to mention Michigan as well. You look at their schedule, not only do they play Oregon, and Ohio State, but they also get Texas as well. you got to think those are three spots where they're more than likely to lose given the turnover there. Um, I think it's down at eight and a half now, as Joe was mentioning. I still even think you can consider that um, because you could see Alex Orgy struggle his first year under center or Sharon Moore, again, struggle his first year on the headset. But I'll go with an emotional play here. And, Greg, we talked about this on ESPN Bet Live. My Missouri Tigers – you know, expectations are high in Columbia. Nine and a half is a high win total for a, a school like Missouri in the SEC. We haven't seen this since Gary Pinkle was there with, you know, James Franklin and uh, Marcus Lucas, some of those guys that they, you know, won the East a couple of years right when they got into the conference. So this is an exciting time to be a Tiger fan because of Brady Cook and Luther Burden. But going over nine and a half, despite having one of the more manageable, as you instructed me to say when we're discussing an SEC schedule, um, one of the more manageable in the conference. They, they play Alabama. They play Oklahoma. That's about it as far as really difficult on the schedule spots, and they get Oklahoma and Columbia. Um, I still think the losses on defense for Eli Drinkwitz might be too much to overcome. I think the offense is going to be good again, just like we saw last year. Cook a senior, Burden, maybe the best wide receiver in the entire country. But you not only lost uh, your top pass rusher in Darius Robinson, your top two corners, including Ennis Rakestraw, to the draft. You lost Blake Baker, who was so highly regarded as Eli Drinkwitz's defensive coordinator that we saw Coach Kelly down in Baton Rouge say, I'm going to pay you more money than any other coordinator in the entire country to fix my defense, which was dreadful last year, trying to back up Jaden Daniels. So 
Blake Baker's loss, I think, will be felt significantly, even though Corey Batoon is well-respected uh, around the country. It's just uh, you have to prove it at this level if you're Batoon. So the defense, I think, and an emotional hedge play as well um, has me uh, saying Mizzou tops out at nine wins this year. Yeah, it's, uh, the Mizzou one, I always look at it, and look, it's the football gods. You're 4-0 oh in one-score games. Those yeah. things have yeah. a way of kind the of The Florida ringing, game last year. You know, the Florida game, the Kansas State game, e- even the game against, I believe it was Memphis, it was like, yeah, I just was wanting a little more and didn't get it. So I think Mizzou is the one that I'd stay away from. I feel like the numbers inflated this. Everyone's looking at the schedule. Oh, it's manageable. Oh, it's, it's still an SEC schedule. There's going to yeah. be some hiccups. The game at a and I think, is the one that's going to determine the over or the under. In that scenario, a couple that I like, I love Iowa State, seven and a half. I think Iowa State's one of those teams that's kind of sliding under the radar, tons of production back, bit of a tumultuous offseason leading into 23. Then they insert Rocco back in the lineup. He had a rock-solid entry-level start, I think, for a first-year guy that was not expected to be the starter to thrust in there just a few weeks before season starts, and all of a sudden he's the Big 12 Rookie of the Year. They bring back just about everybody. They kind of established an identity down the stretch. They went seven and six but they went six and three in big 12 play. One of those losses was against the Texas Longhorns. They played Texas better than most. So I like the over for Iowa state at seven and a half. You can get that at a decent number. I like the over on Iowa. A lot of buzz about Iowa. <laughs> yeah. I know you guys are going to laugh. I look at that game and I look at their schedule and I think that there's going to be a bit of a transition period for some of the teams out West playing against the physicality that is Iowa. They're going to slow the game. They're going to put you to sleep, and they're going to make you greedy because you might only get 55 snaps offensively, whereas in 23 when you're playing against Pac-12 foes, guess what? You're getting 80, 85 snaps a game offensively, so that pace is going to be unique, and I like what their schedule is. How many times, Joe, I know you've looked at it, how many times on the schedule right now do you consider Iowa to be a dog? At this point, I got them in one game. They, they, there's a lot to like, especially with Ferentz being out as the uh, offensive coordinator, because if you can modernize that offense, even 5%, it would go a long way with this defense. The one concern, the one concern is the one score game record. Yeah. They won all their one score games last year, <laughs> but to your point, the schedule sets up nice considering what a lot of teams are going to be dealing with in, um, in, in the transition over to the big 10, you could end up getting an awful draw. They ended up doing pretty well. They really did love, and I also keeping in the Big Ten. I love Rutgers. Yeah, and we've yeah. talked about this. <laughs> Do not perception of yet. Rutgers is that they're a bottom tier Big Ten team. Not saying perception isn't reality, but I also acknowledge that in a divisionless Big Ten, the world just got a whole lot easier for Rutgers. They bring back a ton of production. They have an identity. They want to run the football. They're going to be tough as nails defensively. And I think the one position that was a major liability last year was quarterback. And with all due respect to Wimsett, he completed 47% of his passes. It's just not good enough. And I think that Ethan Kaliak Manis, while not a superstar, will be a little more efficient to take some of the pressure off that run game. And their schedule, extremely manageable. I even think they could get their run in the non-conference. If you look at their non-conference record the last two years, really, really impressive, especially against the spread. They get Virginia Tech in the non-conference. Like I wouldn't be shocked if they got that one. It wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me. So... That's another team. So uh, normally, anything- normally by this point, the bad numbers have been hammered into shape. That one is still sitting there at six, and the juice is reasonable. That's the surprise to me. It feels like not enough people have woken up to the fact that Rutgers is better, and the schedule relative to the rest of the Big Ten is a phenomenal layout for them. I, you would have figured by now they'd have gone to six and a half or heavily juiced it like they did with the Texas under. They haven't. They haven't. I'm, I'm surprised by that. Are you just trying try to talk me out of it? Is that what you're saying? No. You're talking me no. out of it? Hey, Vegas knows. They're just baiting you at that six. <laughs> That's fine. All right. We'll, we'll see. I, I, I'm, I'm quite the opposite. I very much like that wager, Gregory. <laughs> okay. I'm glad. All right. Let's move into a couple of – you said, Joe, that you were on a bunch of yes-no bets for the yeah. playoff. But I want to go to Tyler on this one first. Tyler, is there anything you like right now yeah. as far as preseason – hey, I like – so and so to win the Big Twelve, the ACC. Are there any plays right. that you can get there with good value in the SEC? Stanford, Steve, and Joe were talking about this program uh, down in Oxford. Ole Miss, Jackson Dart. I know Lane Kiffin hasn't, you know, kind of gotten over the hump at the collegiate level, but there's a lot of talent on that team, despite the loss of Quinchon Judkins in the backfield. Um, Dart is a 
I think, reasonable play right now. If you had to get involved in the Heisman market, he should put up numbers. And if Ole Miss is able to get to that schedule with 10 or more wins, they'd be a college football playoff qualifier. And he'd kind of meet all of those criteria. So I, I'm, not a, I'm not afraid to throw in the SEC some money at teams like Ole Miss and like Tennessee with Nico Iamaliava. And I just kind of wanted to say his there name. You go. I've been working on that. But Bro. I, I, Heifel, Heifel's offense, we saw average 46 points a game with Hendon Hooker. I don't think Joe Milton is, even though he's been impressive in his preseason debut in the NFL, was that great of a college quarterback because of some accuracy issues. But we saw what Heifel's offense can do if he has a, a good college quarterback. And I think Iamaliava can be that after what we saw in the Cheez-It Bowl, the four touchdowns, he's got very – very dangerous uh, legs and his ability to run where Hooker is probably the better natural passer. Uh, Ian Maliava can probably do a little more damage with his legs. So if that offense gets back up to 40, 45 points per game, James Pierce could be the number one overall pick in the NFL draft as an edge rusher there. If that defense uh, is able to kind of um, be middle of the pack, so to speak, in the SEC, I think those two teams that are not Georgia, that are not Alabama, that are kind of in that second tier of the SEC with me going into this season with an embrace embrace change type of mentality those are two programs i'd be willing to right now throw a little bit of money on given that i see some value there joe what about you with some preseason stuff to win a conference anything you like utah obviously still at plus money they're not going to play kansas state i won't you know bend your ear on that one anymore i think you've heard just about enough of me on the Utes <laughs> this season uh to go back to miami again in the acc yep. i think there's an opportunity there they're still sitting out there plus money a lot of people love Florida State. Uh, again, it's one of those, we saw it last year, so it should happen again. Norvell hits the transfer portal really hard. He's fantastic at that. But they still lost a lot. Five starters on defense went in the NFL draft. They lost their quarterback. There's a lot they got to figure out, and they're going to be on the road at Miami. So that's one that sits there. If you want to go deeper down the board, Texas State is just sitting there at 13-1 <laughs> to 1 to make the playoff. And they are not a noticeable dog in any of the 12 games they have on their schedule. You, you could justifiably make the case Texas State's going to be a favorite in all 12 games. And at 13-1 to 1 to make the playoff, one of the non-Power 4 highest-rated yeah. teams has to get there. Liberty's obviously the favorite. Memphis, uh, Texas San Antonio are three teams that people like. But Texas State at 13-1 to 1 is a strong play there, in my opinion. And then Notre Dame to make the playoff, you're laying yeah. juice on that. But you can always get out of it in some regard if you don't like the way it goes with AM. But if they get past AM, the schedule sets up so nicely. And with Denbrock coming over from LSU as the offensive coordinator and Riley Leonard transferring in at quarterback, it feels like they're set up really nicely. They should be a favorite in all 12. The one where they're not going to be double digits outside of AM is the USC game, but they're probably still laying six on the road. So assuming there's not some sort of crazy variance with injuries or one-score games, Notre Dame's going to be there in that final 12. Gentlemen, this was awesome, man. We so appreciate your time today. Can't wait to do it again. We'll have you back throughout the season, make some more picks, and and dive into some of your thought process of how you're going to play some of these things on the stretch. But Tyler, Joe, awesome as always. Really appreciate you guys. Of course. Thanks for having us on. Yeah, thanks, Greg. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to ask all of you to like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get the show. We very much appreciate your support here in the early part of the season. It's been a chaotic couple weeks. Tons of downloads, tons of people joining the show for the very first time. We just ask that you continue to like, rate, subscribe, all those wonderful things. But more importantly, tell your friends. We are doing... A lot of things to try to get you prepared for the college football season. We feel like we do it as well as anybody. So we look forward to having you back with us when we welcome in a couple nice guests here in the next couple of weeks as we continue to steam ahead just nine days, ten days away from the college football season officially getting underway. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have an amazing day. And remember, it's always college football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.